Hello and welcome to C++ Weekly. I'm your host, Jason Turner. In this episode, I want to ask the question as to whether or not and when we think that AI might start replacing programmers. Now, of course, I want to remind you to check out all of the links in the video description so that you can support this channel and become a member and subscribe, because those are important things for the livelihood of a YouTube channel. So you've probably heard of this chat GPT program, which is part of OpenAI. And if you have not actually seen this before, I'm going to run through a few examples to kind of illustrate why I've been thinking about this. So you have this chat prompt here, and you might type in something like this. And I'm asking the chatbot to take the C++ 98 code and convert it to C++ 11 code. Now, it did skip a step here that you might have noticed, and it went to C++ 17 directly, even though I asked specifically for C++ 11. But I would say it did a pretty good job of it. It determined that it can use a structured binding, it explains the things that we did here, and it is given appropriate names to these two variables, and it looks pretty good. It's using a ranged-based for loop. But we could further ask it to do work like convert this last thing to use lib format, which you've seen on this channel before, which is a really well done tool. And as you can see, it can do that with no problem at all. And as far as I can tell, this code looks all correct to me. And then you can further ask it to do things like convert this last example to Python. And it does. But if you're familiar with Python, then you might know this is not the best way to do this. So I can ask it to update the Python example to use string interpolation. And there we go. That's looking like a pretty good Python example. Uh, it does assume that map and dict and things like that are strings and integers. But now we start to wonder what happens if I say something like convert this Python example back into C++ 98. Well, that looks pretty good. It added in an end line, which you know that I don't like, but it looks like it did a pretty good job on that as well. So it's clearly not just regurgitating the first thing that I asked it for. That's pretty cool. But then we can do things like Say I want to create a templated C++ function to compare any two values, let's give it the correct wording here, with a less than comparison. Okay, that looks pretty good. And it even gave um, an example for how to use it. Although it doesn't know that you don't actually need to pass that template parameter that template type deduction would work out there. But I could do something like ask it if it can use the auto concept. Yeah, no, it didn't actually gain anything there. It says that it uses the auto keyword, but it doesn't. Let's try again. I want to limit the C++ code to only integral types. There we go. So it used the terse syntax. Now it's requiring them to be the same type T, but that looks pretty good. This is one of my more interesting experiments that I've done with this. 
Now, I've tried this before in a different line of questioning, but I'm tired of people always passing T as the template type. So let's just see what happens if I ask for a more meaningful name. Huh, now it just lost the last change there. So, you know, are these going to replace programmers? Maybe not yet, but it's still pretty good. Let's see if we can say, I, I wanted to add some catch to test for me. Oh, there we go. Require fault. Yep. Yeah, that seems to, that seems to be pretty good. I wonder if I can ask it to make the previous version const expert. Okay, good. That's not bad at all right there. Let's see if it knows how to use static assert or not. And just for the record, I am intentionally not speeding any of these things up. There we go. So it added some static assert compile time enabled test for our const expert enabled less than function. Pretty spectacular, huh? I mean, um, maybe not replacing programmers yet, but let's try another line of questioning. I really think that it should be best practice to prefer dot at instead of the bracket operator, the index operator when you are using standard vector, for example, because then you can accidentally iterate past the end of it. So let's go ahead and do something like this. I'm going to ask it to make a clean tidy check for me that prefers the dot at meth member function over the index operator when it exists for the type being operated on and when the dot at member and index operator take the same type and that type is integral. Now I've tried various versions of this already in the past and it does a surprisingly good job. Um, it's going to take a minute. I haven't actually tested this code to compile and obviously I don't even know if this is going to give me the same result because as a human I give it different wording each time I play it along these lines. And again, I am making a point of not speeding any of this up. We might need to take this example and put it in the other OpenAI playground, but let's see what we've got. Prefer at over index operator. It's clean tidy check. Let's see. We're going to have to scroll back on this. This assumes that I'm familiar with the clean tidy framework, etc. Let's see, it has register a matcher. It looks for an index expression that has an argument that is an integer literal. Mm, that might be a little bit step too far. I just want it to be an integer type, not an integer literal. But then that builds us the expression. And we take that expression down here when we do the check. And we say prefer using dot at member over index operator. And it looks to see create replacement. Okay, so it does the create replacement. Well, let's just go ahead and ask it to, well, let's go ahead and see if it can properly add some unit tests for this clean tidy check.
So it's not in this case creating an explicit cling tidy style check here, but it did create, I think, a catch. That looks like catch to me, perhaps. Uh, no, G test. That might, well, whatever. It created some unit test for us as well that calls those functions directly. Well, that's pretty good. And just in case you wonder like how limited this thing is, if I really wanted to, I could do something like this. That looks pretty good. It's iterating from one to 10 and printing out JSON was here on each loop iteration. Yeah, I would say that that is pretty much exactly what we asked it to do, but I hate end line. And I'm just gonna ask it nicely. I've never phrased it quite like this before and I'm gonna see what it does. much better. Uh, although, again, now we're really pushing it past things that I've asked it to do in experiments before recording this episode. But let's go ahead and do this. Yeah, at this point, you start to wonder if there's actually a human involved here. It does actually tell us that it can be printed to the standard output stream in a single step. Simplifies code makes it more efficient. Okay, very good. Uh, it's older and less powerful programming language. Thanks. I have no idea if this is going to be able to do this or not, but you know, this is one of these annoying things when you're actually programming and basic with line numbers and you end up saying, oh no, I created lines 21, 22, and 23, and I need to insert line 22 and a half. Well, it was able to do that. It's pretty impressive, really. Okay, so we have this simple example in arguably C, not C++, that for zero through four prints hello and then prints world. So let's see, it prints hello and then it prints world and then it subtracts one from the counter. If it's not zero yet, then it iterates up. So it starts at five and it counts down. Now we're going to try this and we're gonna see what the chatbot can do with this. Yeah, that looks pretty, pretty accurate. You know, I don't like endline and it keeps using it, even though I tell it repeatedly to not use endline. So let's see what happens if I convert this into C.
That's better. That's right back to the puts that I had earlier. Let's see if we can take this entire example full circle. That might be correct. I think that might be correct. Of course, it complains all along that Kellner 64 basic is old. Now, of course, we would want to know how to do this on a BBC micro as well. I state for the record that at this point, very little of what I'm showing you was actively planned. This is just examples that I thought of on the fly. So we will give one further test, and this is the one that first blew my mind when I was playing with this. I'm going to ask it to create programming exercises for you. Besides being able to modernize and demodernize code and convert between different programming languages and disassemble and create complex test for us and add unit test for our programs, we could do something like this. Let's see. The exercise is write a Python function is prime. Oh, look, it even used typed Python. That's rather fancy. And I didn't really like that one. This definitely raises lots of questions, of course, about code ownership, copyright, um, the meaning of creation and all kinds of stuff. I find this all very interesting and the results that it's giving us are, are fascinating indeed. So I hope that you liked this episode of C++ Weekly. It was perhaps a bit slower than usual. Huh. So be sure to subscribe and catch you in the next episode.